In this presentation, we're going to take a look at the book of Helaman, chapters 1 through 6, and take a look at some of the doctrines and principles that we learn from Helaman chapters 1 through 6. So with that in mind, here is a small introduction to the book of Helaman. Though but a brief segment of the entire record, the book of Helaman is packed full of timeless and timely messages. In that book we read with sadness of the rise of secret combinations and the Gadianton bands, and we have reaffirmed in our minds and hearts that Satan, that insane insomniac who is the king of Babylon, is alive and well on planet Earth. At the same time, we glory in the call and ministry of Nephi and Lehi, sons of Nephi, or Helaman, two spiritual giants raised up in a wicked day to declare repentance and lead the believing souls to peace and salvation. We thrill with the messianic prophecies of Samuel the Lamanite and treasure up his marvelous words concerning our deliverance from death and sin through the mortal ministry of Christ the Lord. Helaman 1 through 4 presents a stark contrast between the fruits of good and evil. We see the results of evil upon society as well as the individual. The personal growth and blessings obtained by saints who remain faithful in challenging circumstances can provide us with courage to remain true to righteous principles during difficult times. We can contrast the discord brought by wickedness with the great peace and joy obtained by righteousness. Noting these contrasts provides motivation to chart a course based upon principles that will bring happiness and avoid the misery that comes from disobedience. With that, here is a look at something that pertains to Helaman chapters 1 through 6. In Helaman chapters 1 through 6, President Ezra Taft Benz said the following about the Nephite record, referring to all of the book of Helaman through 3 Nephi 9. He said, quote, The record of the Nephite history just prior to the Savior's visit reveals many parallels to our own day as we anticipate the Savior's second coming. And so the signs and different events that happen in Helaman through 3 Nephi 9 parallel the events that are going to happen in his second coming. So I have now here for chapters 1 through 6, the following chart shows those parallels that are in Helaman 1 through 6. So on the left is the references referring to Christ coming to the Nephites. Then we have the event or sign, and then on the right is the reference pertaining to how that is a parallel event that will happen prior to Christ's second coming. Now, I'm not going to read through all of the different references, but we'll just give the signs, and you can look up the references and refer to this later on your own. First of all, number one, coming from first, or Helaman chapter 1 and chapter 2, we have the sign that there was freedom and a democratic form of government in power. And so in 2 Nephi 10, we see that that will be true also prior to Christ's second coming. There will be a democratic form of government in power. Number two in Helaman chapter 1 and 6 and 11, those other references there, the sign or event is there will be secret combinations, organizations that attempt to get money, power, by any means. And then in 3 Nephi and DNC, we see that that event will also happen prior to the second coming. Or that, those events. Number three in Helaman chapter 1 and 2 and 7 and 3 Nephi 7, we see the sign or event, government power struggle, and eventually the government breakdown. So we'll see the breakdown of a democratic government. Well, in Journal of Discourses, Journal of Discourse, Volume 2, 182, Volume 7, page 15, and Volume 21, 104, talk about how there will be a governmental breakdown prior to Christ's second coming. Helaman, chapter 1 and 10 and 11 and 3 Nephi 2, we see there will be wars and rumors of wars. And of course, that is discussed in DNC 45 and Joseph Smith, Matthew 1, 29. Helaman 5, 2 
we see that there was one wicked man's power. Now, I don't know the exact mean or details of that, but the wicked, the wickedness of one man's power. We certainly see that in Helaman. It just takes one wicked king. Well, Daniel chapter 8 and 11 talk about one wicked man's power prior to Christ's second coming. Number 6, Helaman 3 and 10 and 11 and 35, 6. We see the event of advancements in industry and technology and progress that the Nephites had. Well, we'll also have that in the latter days in Daniel 12 and Revelation 9. Number 7, Helaman 3, 5, 6, 16, 3 Nephi 7. We see strong righteous minority. So there will be a strong righteous minority. There was among the Nephites. That is a parallel event to his coming as talked about in 1 Nephi 14 and Jacob 5. Number 8, Helaman 3 and 3 Nephi 1 talk about great growth, prosperity, happiness, and peace within the church. Daniel 2.44 and Jacob 5.72 talk about that as a parallel event that will happen prior to Christ's second coming. Certainly we are learning, living during this time. We have seen such tremendous growth in the church in the last, say, 30, 40 years. And will continue to grow. Number 9, Helaman 3 and 4 and 11. The event, there will be much pride among those who professed to belong to the church. So when there's going to be a lot of growth, there's going to be pride that creeps within the church as it did in Helaman's time. Well, DNC 29 and a hundred, uh, section 112, 24 through 26 talks about that that sign or event will be repeated prior to Christ's second coming. We will see pride among the church, which we certainly see happening today. Number 10, Helaman 3, 4. There, will be great, there was great immorality among the Nephites. Well, that will happen again. 2 Timothy 3, 2 Nephi 27. There will be great immorality prior to Christ's second coming. Number 11, Helaman 4. There will be a civil war between the north and the south. Between the north countries and the south country and the Nephites. In Helaman, there was a war, civil war. And certainly that was prophesied in DNC 87. And we have had that civil war in the Americas prior to Christ's second coming. And who knows when that may even happen again besides the one that happened in 1861. Helaman 5 and 11 talk about that there were two great prophets with power. That's Nephi and Lehi, the two sons of Helaman. There was two great prophets. Well, that is prophesied in Revelation 11 and DNC 77. There will be two great prophets in Jerusalem prior to Christ's second coming. Helaman 5 and 15 there are many of the Lamanites join the church more than the Nephites. So we get, let me change this. This L should be a colon. There are many more Lamanites in the church now than there are Nephites. Well, we see in Helaman 15, DNC 49, that there will be many more members of the church outside the United States than there will be within the United States, where you see a bulk, where a bulk of the majority once was. We'll see that repeated. Number 14, Helaman 6 and 11 and 16 and 3 Nephi, there will be great wickedness upon the earth. Well, 2 Timothy 3 and DNC 45. That again will be repeated. Number 15, Helaman 6. A marked, a marked, a marked, um, I, I think that should be a market of commerce, trade, and exchange. A market, sorry. Market of commerce, trade, and exchange. 
Revelation 13, 62, 17 talks about that happening again. And certainly we see that happening. We're living during that time. And in number 16, Helaman 6 and 35, 7, the righteous sorrow because of great wickedness. We'll see the righteous sorrowing. Isaiah prophesies that in the last days and DNC 42. So there, as far as chapters 1 through 6, those signs are events that did happen to the Nephites, and that will be parallel to events that will happen in prior to Christ's second coming. So with that, here is taking a look at Helaman's chapters 1 through 5, I believe six teachings that this chapter gives us that will prepare us for the Savior's coming. Number 1, Helaman 1, 4 through 8. Causing division led to spiritual death. This is one of the things that decries those in the celestial kingdom. We are to be united as a people, especially to the Lord's anointed, and to sustain and support one another. Christ is about unity, not diversity. And this is one of those things that decries... And I, Apologize I'm, I, for that typo there. Number two, Helaman 118. The Nephites were attacked at the heart of their land because they did not have sufficient, sufficient guards there. We need to protect our hearts. That is the center of our being, being feelings, emotions, spirit, etc., which the Lord requires that we sacrifice to him. What our heart is set on is our treasure in Matthew 6. It is through our eyes, thoughts, and what we decide to look upon is how our heart is affected. You can see that in Joe Smith translation, Matthew 6, 22, 24. Therefore, we need to guard carefully what we take into our heart through our eyes. If we do so and set our eyes only on God and the things of God, we will see him one day. That should be and. Sorry about that. Number three, Helaman 2, 6 through 8. Since the wicked are mingled among us, we need to know the hearts of men as did the servants of Helaman. We need the power of discernment that will be vital in the last days. We need the power of discernment so we can discern men's hearts and know who to follow. Number four, Helaman 3, 33-35, the ability to say nevertheless as we are persecuted or offended and still have faith in the Savior and go stronger and stronger in humility. On the plagues in the church is that too many are waiting to be offended. I'm so sorry, that should be one of the plagues. Uh, and one of the great plagues we see in the church in the latter days. One of the great plagues in the church is that too many of us are waiting to be offended, thus losing their salvation. Number five, a teaching from Helaman 5, 4 through 14. The Nephites lost many dissenters to the Lamanites because of their wickedness and abominations, which was among those who professed to belong to the church. And because of their pride, members oppressed the poor, withhold their food clothing from the poor, and smiting their humble brethren upon the cheek, making a mockery of that which was sacred, denying the spirit of prophecy and revelation, murdering, plundering, lying, stealing, committing adultery, and rising up in great contempt. Attention. Thus, because of this great wickedness and their boasting in their own strength, they did not prosper and were driven before the Lamanites. Therefore, we must do the opposite of all of those things to be prepared for the Savior's coming. And number six, one other teaching that will help prepare us is Helaman 5, 28-49. To overcome the midst of darkness that overcame the wicked, they must heed the voice of God to repent and seek not to destroy God's servants. As they do this, the wicked will come to see God's servants, that they are protected and directed by God's Spirit. 
As the wicked exercise faith in God and cry unto him for forgiveness, they will have the cloud of darkness dispersed from them and come to see God's servants as his anointed leaders that converse with God and angels which leads the wicked to their conversion. We today must come to see and know that God's prophets are sent by him and are directed by him. So there are six things that will help us prepare that we learn from this chapter. Let's now start with Helaman chapter 1, some of the commentary on the doctrines and principles. Chapter 1, verses 2 through 12. Therefore, there began to be a serious contention. The book of Helaman recounts a period of great wickedness among the Nephites. The Ganyan robbers thrived and the masses endured several cycles of wickedness and destruction, followed by repentance only to return to wickedness. Many of those troubles could be attributed to contention that began in the first chapter of Helaman. While some people might consider contention to be rather in an innocuous sin, the following general authorities have commented on the dangers of contention. President James E. Faust taught the following on the importance of overcoming contention through being unified. Quote, As a prelude to the specific item I wish to discuss, I believe it is important to set forth a few fundamental principles as I understand them. The object of God's work is to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. God has given the priesthood to man at various times since Adam's day to bring about the great plan of salvation for all mankind. Through our faithfulness, the transcendent blessings of eternal life flow from this priesthood authority. For those priesthood blessings to flower, there is a constant need for unity within the priesthood. We must be loyal to the leadership who have been called to preside over us and hold the keys of the priesthood. The words of President J. Reuben Clark still ring loud in our ears. Brother Clark said, Brethren, let us be united, he explained. An essential part of unity is loyalty. Loyalty is a pretty difficult quality to possess. It requires the ability to put away selfishness, greed, ambition, and all of the baser qualities of the human mind. You cannot be loyal unless you are willing to surrender his own Preferences and desires must be put away, and he must see only the great purposes which lies at ahead. That's the end of President Reuben Clark. Back to Brother Faust. In some legislative assemblies of the world, there are some groups termed the loyal opposition. I find no such principle in the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Savior gave us this solemn warning. If be one, and if you are not one, ye are not mine. Free discussion and expression are encouraged in the church. Certainly, the open expression is most fast in testimony meetings. Or Sunday school release site and precinct meetings attest to that principle. However, the privilege of free expression should operate within limits. In 1869, George Q. Cannon, probably of the First Presidency, I believe, at least of the Quorum of the Twelve, explained the limits of individual expressions when he said, A friend wished to know whether we consider an honest difference of opinion between a member of the church and the authorities of the church was apostasy. We replied that we could conceive of a man honestly differing in opinion from the authorities of the church and yet not be an apostate. But... We could not conceive of a man publishing those differences of opinion and seeking by arguments, sophistry, and special pleading to enforce them upon the people to produce division and strife and to place the acts and counsels of the authorities of the church, if possible, in a wrong light and not be an apostate. For such conduct was apostasy as we stood the term. So you could have a difference of opinion. Just keep it to yourself. You start publishing it and demanding that others believe it and putting down the brethren, then that is apostasy. Continuing Elder Faust, Among the activities considered apostate to church of the church include when members, one, repeatedly act in clear, open, and deliberate public opposition to church or its leaders. Two, persist in teaching as church doctrine information that is not church doctrine after being corrected by their bishop or higher authority. Or three, continue to follow the teachings of apostate cults, such as those that advocate plural marriage, after being corrected by their bishops or higher authority. 
Those men and women who persist in publicly challenging basic doctrines, practices, and the establishment of the church sever themselves from the Spirit of the Lord and forfeit their right to place to place and influence in the church. Members are encouraged to study the principles and doctrines of the church so they understand them. Then, if questions arise and there are honest differences of opinion, members are encouraged to discuss those matters privately with priesthood leaders. You are more than welcome to take and lead yourself down to hell, brothers and sisters. But it is apostasy if you decide to take others with you. Continuing Elder Faust, there is a certain arrogance in thinking that any of us may be more spiritually intelligent, more learned, or more righteous than the councils called to preside over us. Those councils are more in tune with the Lord than any individual person they preside over, and the individual members of the councils are generally guided by those councils. In our desire to be broad-minded, to be accepted, to be liked and admired, let us not trifle with the doctrine and the covenants which have been revealed to us, nor with the pronouncements of those who have been given the keys of the kingdom of God on earth. For all of us, the words of Joshua ring with an increasing revelance. Choose this day whom you will serve, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. End of President Faust. On another occasion, President Faust stated in forthright terms that the Spirit of the Lord cannot abide contention. Quote, when there is contention, the Spirit of the Lord will depart, regardless of who, fall, who is at fault. End of quote. Elder Joseph B. Worland of the Council of the Twelve Apostles explained that contention is purposely fostered by Satan to sever his own to serve his own evil purposes. Quote, the sins of corruption, dishonesty, strife, contention, and other evils in the world are not here by chance. They are evidences of the relentless campaign of Satan and those who follow him. He uses every tool and device available to him to deceive, confuse, and mislead. End of quote. In contrast to the destructive impact of contention, President Henry B. Iron of the First Presidency emphasized the unity of the spirit of peace. Quote, when people have the spirit with them, we may expect harmony. The spirit puts the testimony of truth in our hearts, which unifies those who share that testimony. The Spirit of God never generates contention. It never generates the feelings of distinctions between people which lead to strife. It leads to, it leads to personal peace and a feeling of union with others. It unifies souls, a unified family, a unified church, and a world at peace unified or depend on unified souls. End of quote. Don't buy into the false ideology and philosophy of diversity. And that we must tolerate everybody's diversity. God is not interested in division or diversity. He is interested in unity and in loyalty. Chapter 1, verse 8. The phrase, tried according to the voice of the people and condemned unto death. Panchia is tried for capital offense, not because he disagreed with the outcome of the election or because he sought to become the chief judge, but rather that he raised up in rebellion and sought to destroy the liberty of the people. His crime is one of sedition and treason. He is to be judged according to the laws established by Mosiah II. The exact nature of the voice of the people that found him guilty and condemned him to death is not given in the text, but based on other uses of the phrase, it is either a democratic process, such as a jury of peers, or possibly a theodemocratic council of judges, as it perhaps implies by the record of the trial of Nehor. Chapter 1, verses 9 through 12. They sent forth one Kishkumen, even to the judgment seat of Pahoran, and murdered Pahoran as he sat upon the judgment seat. Followers of Panchia, angry that he would not only not become their chief judge, but they, that he also was condemned to die for his crimes, employed Kishkumen to murder the newly appointed chief judge, Pahoran II. After Kishkumen murders Pahoran, these followers of Panchia enter into a covenant bound by secret oaths to tell no one of their complicity in the murder. 
A number of those accomplices to the murder are executed, yet many hide themselves by mingling among the people. Their remnant of dissents becomes the genius of the secret, or the genesis of the secret combinations that would continually plague the people of Nephi and would ultimately bring about their destruction as a nation. And the secret combinations will also be the death knell of the destruction of our nation if we do not get a hold of it that is happening today. Chapter 1, verse 18, because of so much contention and so much difficulty in the government, because of the controversy and contention surrounded, surrounding the selection of the chief judge and a subsequent rebellion and the confusion, fear, and difficulties associated with the murder of Pahoran, the Nephites are unprepared to defend themselves against an outside attack from the Lamanites. Dissension and conflict from within creates a vulnerability to attack from without. A house divided against itself cannot stand. This important principle not only has application to government or national security, but is also significant in the institutional church and in our individual homes. Contention and dissension are the tools of the adversary that weakness the in, that weakens the institution and makes it vulnerable to attacks from destructive outside influences. Chapter 1, verse 33, the phrase prisoners should depart out of the land in peace. In contrast to the treatment of prisoners and innocent victims of war by the Lamanites, Moroni allows the Lamanite prisoners of war to depart in peace. Those righteous military leaders who are disciples of Christ and are filled with the Spirit of the Lord treat even their enemies with kindness and compassion. Even in most difficult circumstances such as war, the, the Lord expects his disciples to love your enemies, do good to them that hate you. That's from the Sermon on the Mount. Now let's go to Helaman chapter 2. Chapter Helaman chapter chapter 1 and 2, we see evil secret works can destroy societies. Elder M. Russell Ballard of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained that the threat of secret combinations still exists in our day. Quote, the Book of Mormon teaches that secret combinations engaged in crime present a serious challenge not only to just individuals and families, but to entire civilizations. Among today's secret combinations are gangs, drug cartels, and organized crime families. The secret combinations of our day function much like the Gadiant robbers of the Book of Mormon times. They have their secrets signs and code words. They participate in secret rites and initiation ceremonies. Among their purposes are to murder and plunder and steal and commit whoredoms and all manner of wickedness contrary to the laws of their country and also the laws of their God. If we are not careful, today's secret combinations can obtain power and influence just as quickly and just as completely as they did in the Book of Mormon times. Do you remember the pattern? The secret combination began among the more wicked part of the society, but eventually seduced the more part of the righteous until the whole society was polluted. The Book of Mormon teaches that the devil is the author of all sin and the founder of the, these secret combinations. He uses secret combinations, including gangs, from generation to generation, according as he can get hold upon the hearts of the children of men. His purpose is to destroy individuals, families, communities, and nations. To a degree, he was successful during Book of Mormon times, and he is having far too much success today. That's why it is so important for us as priesthood holders to take a firm stand for truth and right by doing what we can, what we can to help keep our communities safe. End of Elder Ballard's quote. Helaman, again, chapters 1 through 2, God, good people can help thwart the goals of evil organizations. During the General Conference following the terrorist attack on the World Trade Center in the Pentagon, President Gordon B. Hinckley referred to terrorist organizations determined to foster murder, tyranny, fear, and wicked control. Quote, terrorist organizations must be fretted out and brought down. We of this church know something of such groups. The Book of Mormon speaks of the Gadiant and robbers, of a vicarious oaths bound, and secret organizations bent on evil and destruction. In their day, they did all in their power by whatever means available to bring down the church, to woo the people with sophistry, and to take control of society. We see the same thing in the present situation. 
We are people of peace. We are followers of Christ, who was and is the Prince of Peace. But there are times when we must stand up for right and decency, for freedom and civilization, just as Moroni rallied his people in his day to the defense of their wives, their children, and the cause of liberty. End of his quote. Chapter 2, verse 4, the phrase, expert in many words and also in his craft. Mormon describes Ganyan, the leader of the band formed by Kishkumen, as exceedingly expert in many words and also in his craft. It is significant that these traits are similar to those found in such antichrist as Sherem, Nehor, and Korahor. Gadianton's and use of many words and flattery to bring about his evil designs, as in the case of the Antichrist, was acquired through the tutelage of Satan. Gadianton was expert in his craft because he had been taught and influenced according to the power of the devil. Chapter 2, verse 8, the phrase, his object to murder and to rob and to gain power. Mormon tells us that it was design or secret plan of the Gadiant ban or murderer Rob to murder Rob and gain power. Power was the ultimate objective. Robbery and murder are merely means to that end. Chapter 2, verse 13. This Gadiant did prove the overthrow, yea, almost the entire destruction of the people of Nephi. This editorial statement of Mormon foreshadows the numerous references and examples of the secret plans and combinations that follow. Mormon is instructing his readers concerning this underlying and reoccurring theme in the sad story of the demise of the Nephite nation that follows, and probably warning us that this could be our demise too, if we do not get rid of such organizations. Helaman, chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 7. The phrase became exceedingly expert in the working of cement. Because of the desolation of forest and the dearth of timber, lumber, and uh, of building lumber, the people resorted to use of cement for construction and also imported lumber from the land southward. While this is not significant doctrinally, it does give an additional external evidence of the truthfulness of the book, since Joseph Smith could not have been aware, as a result of his own intellect and learning, of this important item that has since been substantiated by modern scientific findings. For an in-depth discussion of the role Discussion of the role of cement in ancient construction, see Hugh Nibley's Since Camorra, page 254, and An Approach to the Book of Mormon, pages 347 through 348, and the find, research findings of Matthew G. Wells and John H. Welch, John W. Welch, in Concrete Evidences of the Book of Mormon and Insights. Chapter 3, verses 13 through 16. Now there are many records kept of the proceedings of this people. Mormon interjects the comment that many records have been kept concerning specifically these people who migrated northward and the Nephite nation generally. The doctrinal significance of this verse consists not so much in their informing the reader of the many historical records that will deal with virtually every aspect of Nephite culture as in their reminding us that the primary purpose of the Book of Mormon is not one of history. Mormon's statement is that his record or abridgment does not contain a hundredth part of all the history. He is not apologizing, but is, gaining, but is again stating that his objective and his, challenge, and his charge as an abridger and record keeper is of spiritual and not a secular nature. Chapter 3, verse 20, the phrase, That which is right in the sight of God continually. Although times were difficult and society was threatened by evil forces, Helaman's example of steadfastness in doing the Lord's will is a model for us to follow in the challenging latter days. Like Helaman, we can continually strive to do what is right, let the consequence follow. The key word is continually. Elder Spencer J. Condi of the Seventy emphasized the importance of keeping our covenants as a way of developing consistency in doing good. Quote, Perhaps of all the evidence of true conversion and a remission of sins, this is the most significant, the disposition to do evil no more, but to do good continually. 
We can strengthen our disposition to do good each time we make and keep covenants. Each time we participate in priesthood ordinance, the power from on high reach downward and draw us nearer to the heavens. Those who partake of the sacrament and temple ordinances with pure hearts and who faithfully keep their covenants require no lengthy instructions regarding modest dress, the payment of generous fast offerings and tithing, observance of the words of wisdom, or keeping the Sabbath day holy. They need no stern reminder to share the gospel with others, to attend the temples frequently, to conduct family history research or to do their home teaching or visiting teaching, nor do they need nudges to visit the sick and to serve those in need. These are the faithful saints of the Most High who keep the sacred covenants they have made in the house of the Lord, having a determination to serve Him to the end and truly manifest by their works that they have this, received the Spirit of Christ unto the remission of their sins. Covenant keepers live the law of consecration. Their time, talents, and financial resources all belong to the Lord. Keeping their covenants has caused them to develop a disposition to do good continually. End of quote. Chapter 3, verses 24 through 28, the phrase, There was exceedingly great prosperity in the church. During the reign of Helaman II, a righteous and equitable ruler, the wars and contentions cease, and there is a great peace and prosperity among the people. During this time of prosperity, the church is blessed, and the tens of thousands are baptized unto repentance. This growth of the church is so remarkable that even the teachers and leaders of the church are astonished beyond measure. This statement mirrors similar statements of modern church leaders concerning the current astonishing growth of the church. Perhaps this period of time is just the Nephi is just the neat five fulfillment of the Lord's revelation to Habakkuk, one that may have multiple fulfillments, not only in ancient Israel, but also among the Nephites, the modern church, and in years yet to come, wherein God said, I will work a work in your day, which you will not believe it through, though it be told you. That was told to Habakkuk. We are certainly seeing that being fulfilled not only in Habakkuk's day, but in our day that a work is being done and we can hardly believe the work that is going forward and it will continue to become more amazing. We haven't begun to see anything yet as far as the gathering of Israel that is yet to come. While serving as a member of the 70, Elder Dean L. Larson observed a relationship between faithfulness to the Lord and prosperity. Quote, when the lives of the people are in harmony with the Lord's will, all of the essential factors that produce the blessings of God, God designed to give to his children seem to come into line. Love and harmony prevail. Even the weather, the climate, and the elements seem to respond. Peace and tranquility endure. Industry, progress mark the lives of the people. We have the Lord's assurance that he will bless and prosper his people if they will keep his commandments and remember to look to him as the source of their blessings. End of quote. Chapter 3, verses 24 through chapter 4, verse 12. Great prosperity in the church along with great dissension, pride, and wickedness. Remember, there is always opposition in all things. So it would make sense if you see one great righteousness going, you're going to see the other happening. Great wickedness. In Helaman 324 through 4, chapter 4, verse 12, we see how the church prospered greatly, but at the same time had many dissensions and pride among the members. President Brigham Young gave the following explanation as why there was a rise in both prosperity and wickedness. Quote, it was revealed to me in the commencement of this church that the church would spread, prosper, grow, and extend, and that in proportion to the spread of the gospel among the nations of the earth, so the power of Satan rise. It was told you here that Brother Joseph warned the elders of Israel against false spirits. It was revealed to me that if the people did not receive the spirit of revelation that God had sent for the salvation of the world, they would receive false spirits and would have revelation. Men would have revelation, women would have revelation, the priest in the pulpit and the deacon under the pulpit would have revelation, and the people would have revelation enough to damn the whole nation and nations of them unless they would hearken to the voice of God. It was not only revealed to Joseph, but to, you humble, but to your humble servant that false spirits would be as prevalent and as common among the inhabitants of the earth as we now see them. End of President Brigham Young's quote. Chapter 3, verses 27 through 28, thus we may see, speaking of the growth of the church and the blessings of prosperity that were abundantly poured out upon who, 
those who were baptized unto repentance, Mormon uses his Thus We See instructional method to teach an important doctrinal concept. He tells the reader that the Lord is mindful of and merciful to all who call upon his holy name in sincere and faithful prayer. There is no other condition. God is no respecter of persons. Therefore, the invitation to come unto the Lord, be transformed by his gospel, and partake of the blessings of, he of heaven is available to all. Chapter 3, verses 29 through 30. Whosoever will may lay hold upon the word of God. President Ezra Taft Benson taught that certain blessings come only through diligent scripture study. Quote, Success and righteousness, the power to avoid deception, resist temptation, guidance in our daily lives, healing of the soul, these are but a few of the promises the Lord has given to those who will come to his word. Does the Lord promise and not fulfill? Surely if he tells us that these things will come to us, if we lay hold upon his word, then the blessings can be ours. And if we do not, then the blessings may be lost. However diligent we may be in other areas, certain blessings are to be found only in the scriptures, only in coming to the word of the Lord and holding fast to it as we make our way through the mist of darkness to the tree of life. End of quote. This is why Satan is so busy to keep you from scripture study, brothers and sisters. If you see your scripture study failing, you can guarantee that is Satan. Chapter 30, verse 30. The phrase, sit down with Abraham and Isaac and with Jacob. The phrase, to sit down with Abraham and Isaac and with Jacob, means that the faithful will merit the association of these three great patriarchs and the reception of celestial-like rewards. According to Doctrine and Covenants 132.27, Abraham, as Isaac also and Jacob, have entered into their exaltation according to the promises and sit upon thrones and are not angels but are gods. What a blessing that would be to have the same blessings they are now at. Elder, Elder Russell M. Nelson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained that church members may become heirs to the blessings of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Quote, the covenant that the Lord made first, first made with Abraham and reaffirmed with Isaac and Jacob is of transcendent significance. We all are also children of the covenant. We have received, as the day of old, the holy priesthood and everlasting gospel. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are our ancestors. We are of Israel. We have the right to receive the gospel, blessings of the priesthood, and eternal life. Nations of the earth will be blessed by our efforts and by the labors of our posterity. The literal seed of Abraham and those who are gathered into his family by adoption receive those promised blessings, predicated upon the acceptance of the Lord and obedience to his commandments. End of quote. Chapter 3, verses 33 through 34 and verse 36, and then chapter 4, verse 12 lifted up in pride even to the persecution of many of their brethren. That phrase is repeated in these verses. Pride and persecution of others are sins in and of themselves. But Mormon describes the pride res resultant persecution as a great evil because it was saint, a saint against saint persecution. It was coming from those who knew the gospel and had been enlightened and prospered by it. Their knowledge increased their accountability and made their pride induce persecution of their fellow church members an even greater evil that would produce a great condemnation. Mormon was sent careful to point out that pride was not part of the Lord's church, but because of great riches it began to enter into the hearts of some of the members of the church, which had a detrimental effect upon the church in general. President Ezra Taft Benson expressed thoughts in a similar vein, quote, Think of what pride has cost us in the past and what it is now costing in our own lives, our families, and the church. Think of the repentance that of, of the repentance that could take place with lives changed, marriages preserved, and homes strengthened if pride did not keep us from confessing our sins and forsaking them. Think of the many who are less active members of the church because they are offended and their pride will not allow them to forgive or fully sup at the Lord's table. Think of the tens of thousands of young men and couples who could be on missions except for the pride that keeps them from yielding their hearts to God. 
Think of how temple work would increase if the time spent in their godly service were more important than the many peaceful pursuits that compete for our, to for our time. End of quote. Elder D. Todd Christopherson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught that a paramount step in becoming completely faithful in the gospel is the avoidance or removal of pride. He said, quote, How can you make the gospel of Jesus Christ not just an influence in your life, but the controlling influence, and indeed the very core of what you are? As a first step, you must lay aside any feelings of pride that is so common in the world today. By this I mean the attitude that rejects the authority of God to rule in our lives. You hear it expressed in phrases such as, Do your own thing, or right and wrong depend on what I feel is right for me. That attitude is a rebellion against God. End of quote. In the April 1989 General Conference, President Ezra Taft Benson gave his landmark talk on pride. I think it was called Beware of Pride. What follows is his talk in outline form of what constitutes pride. So I went through his talk and then just outlined it and what he said was pride. So here is from President Benson, 1989. It would be good to read the talk after you look at this outline form. Number one, pride is usually thought of as A, self-centeredness, B, conceit, C, boastfulness, D, arrogance, E, haughtiness. These are all elements of pride, but not the core. Number two, central feature of pride is enmity, M -M -T, which means hatred, hostility to, or opposition to, especially in hostility, hatred, or opposition to God. Number three, it is competitive in nature with God. My will versus thy will, thy referring to God. Number four, the prideful wish God would agree with them. Number five, pride is comparison with others. Number six, pride fears man's judgment more than God's. Number seven, what will man think of me is more important than what God thinks of me. Therefore, I give in to the things of man. Number eight, we seek and love praise of others more than the praise of God. Number nine, pride is your reward is being better or having more than others. Number 10, usually thought of those on top looking down, but it can be on those on the bottom looking up. For example, A, gossiping, B, backbiting, C, fault finding, D, living beyond our means, E, envying, F, coveting, G, withholding praise and gratitude to lift others, H, unforgiving and jealous. So all of those are from those at the bottom looking up. All of those constitute pride. Number 11, pride is a struggle with someone that has authority over us. Such as A, parents, B, priesthood leaders, C, teacher, D, God, especially God, struggling with the authority God has over us. And I would say priesthood leaders. For children and teenagers, parents is a strong one. Twelve, pride is the prideful hates the fact, that should be the fact, that someone is above him. That just bothers them. Hates the fact that someone is above them. Number thirteen, pride is selfishness. How does this affect me? I'm self-centered. Pride is self-conceit, number fourteen. Number 15, self-pity is pride. Number 16, worldly self-fulfillment. For the sake of worldly self-fulfillment, to be lifted up in the eyes of others is pride. Number 17, self-gratification is pride. Secret combinations for power, gain, and popularity comes because of pride. 19, contention, arguments, fights, generation gaps, spousal abuse, riots, all are pride. 20, those easily offended are because of pride. 
21, holding a grudge is pride. 22, defensiveness is a pride. 23, self-esteem is based on worldly success is a form of pride. 24, they do not receive counsel or instruction easily from those in authority, such as priesthood leaders, is pride. And 25, won't change their minds to accept truth. They have to be right. That is pride. And then <clears throat> last one, number 26. They refuse to lift and build up others because probably of envy and jealousy. That is pride. So there is an outline for them. Now go read President Benson's talk of 1989, Beware of Pride. Chapter 3, verse 35, they did wax strong in their humility. The development of humility is a strengthening factor that leads to greater faith and joy in the lives of faithful church members then and now. From True to the Faith booklet, to quote, to be humble is, a recognize, is to recognize gratefully your dependency on the Lord and to understand that you have constant need for His support. Humility is an act acknowledgement that your talents and abilities are gifts from God. It is not a sign of weakness, timidity, or fear. It is an indication that you know you know where your true strength lies. You can be both humble and fearless. You can be both humble and courageous. The Lord will strengthen you as you humble yourselves before him. Chapter 3, verse 35, Firm in the Faith. The strength of the church lies in the firm convictions of individual members. Helaman 3.35 describes the lives of church members who are firm in their faith and works. Elder Russell M. Nelson pointed out that such firmness in behavior and attitude is generally indivi is obtained individually. Only as an individual can you develop a firm faith in God and a passion for personal prayer. Only as an individual can you keep the commandments of God. Only as an individual can you repent. Only as an individual can you qualify for the ordinances of salvation and exaltation. End of quote. Chapter 3, verse 35, the phrase, filling their souls with joy and consolation. Because of the persecution of the prideful members of the church, humble followers of Christ were being forced to wade through much affliction. As a result of the pain and affliction, these saints fasted and prayed much, which resulted in greater faith in Christ, which in turn filled their souls with joy and consolation. Even amidst affliction, firm faith in Christ, nurtured and strengthened through fasting and prayer, brings the peaceable things of the kingdom. It is this peace and joy the Savior promised to those who faithfully seek it. Chapter 3, verse 35, the phrase, Sanctification of the heart cometh because of their yielding their hearts unto God. Sanctification has been defined as the process of becoming free from sin, pure, clean, and holy through the atonement of Jesus Christ. Faithful members in Helaman's day continued their spiritual growth, which resulted in the sanctification of their hearts. President James E. Faust taught that such growth comes with the aid of the Holy Spirit, fostering our innermost desires to conduct our lives as the Savior would have us live. During this process, we are sanctified. He said, quote, Christ-like conduct flows from the deepest wellsprings of the human heart and soul. It is guided by the Holy Spirit of the Lord, which is promised in gospel ordinances. Our greatest hope should be to enjoy the sanctification which comes from the divine guidance. Our greatest fear should be to forfeit these blessings. End of quote. To yield our hearts unto God is to inquire diligently to know the mind and will of the Almighty, to give way to and follow the impressions of the Spirit, to have no will but God's will, to have an eye single to the glory of God. Sanctification comes by the power of the Holy Ghost only to those who overcome by faith in Jesus Christ, which is yielding our hearts to him. The saints of Helaman's day continued in good works and became stronger in spiritual good qualities, which in turn resulted in sanctification. Elder D. Todd Christopher explained that sanctification is a step in the path of striving towards perfection. Quote, personal per 
persistence in the path of obedience is something different than achieving perfection in mortality. Perfection is not, as some supposed, a prerequisite for justification and sanctification. It is just the opposite. Justification, being pardoned of sins, and sanctification, being purified, meaning not wanting to sin anymore, are the prerequisites for perfection. We only become perfect in Christ, not independently of him. Thus, what is required of us in order to obtain mercy in the day of judgment is simply diligence. End of quote. When one yields his or her heart to God, he is surrendering his personal desires in exchange for his, the Lord's desires. Elder Neil A. Maxwell of Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught that yielding our hearts and souls to God is the highest form of consecration to the Lord. Quote, Ultimate consecration is the yielding up of oneself to God. Heart, soul, and mind were the encompassing words of Christ in describing the first commandment, which is consistently, not periodically, operative. If it, if it is kept, then our performance will in turn be fully consecrated for the lasting welfare of our soul. Remember the first commandment, to have no other gods before us. Such totality involves the submissive converging of feelings through words and deeds. End of Elder Maxwell's quote. Let's go to Helaman, chapter 4. Chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. The phrase, commencing with dissension from within the church, there arose rebellion in the land that led to civil strife and bloodshed. The rebellious who were driven from the land went into alliance with the Lamanites by stirring them up to anger against the Nephites. Weakened by internal strife, the Nephites were driven from Zarahemla by the Lamanites, and bloody war raged in the land. This episode serves as an individual witness that strife and dissension from within, whether it be in church or state, weakens the institution and makes it vulnerable to attacks from without. Chapter 4, verses 11 through 13, the phrase, The great slaughter which was among them would have not happened had it not been for their wickedness and their abomination. The great slaughter of the Nephites could have been averted, we are told by Mormon, had they remained faithful. Also, or, I'm sorry, Mormon attributes much of the wickedness and abominations of the nation to those who profess to belong to the church of God. Because of their wickedness, they had cut themselves off from the protection of the, the Lord extends to the righteous and were left to their own strength. With no claim upon the promises of the Lord, they were smitten and driven until they had lost possession of almost all of their lands. It is significant that Mormon identifies specific things that comprised the wickedness and abominations of Nephite church members. This itemization is doctrinally important, not merely as a historical account, but as a warning to the latter-day church. Brothers and sisters, our greatest danger comes from those who were once within the apostates. That's what we must be careful. Number one, pride of their heart because of their exceeding riches. It is significant that Mormon lists pride first on his list. Because pride, which is enmity towards God and one's fellow man, is that which leads to all other transgressions. It is, as President Ezra Taft Benson described, declared the universal sin which causes men to let go of the iron rod. Mormon identifies riches as a source of pride of the Nephites. Riches in and of themselves did not create damning pride among the Nephites, but the enmity that resulted from the love of money is what led to a disregard for God and others, resulting thereafter in self-indulgence and wickedness. It should be remembered, however, that there are other sources of pride as well. Whether the source of Pride is a damning sin in the true sense of the word. It limits or stops progression and adversely affects all our relationships. Number two, oppression of the poor. The proud rich look down upon those less fortunate and label them as lazy and unworthy. Their elevated sense of self-importance causes them to unrighteously judge, mock, withhold support from, and even protect the less fortunate. Since pride is competitive in nature, the oppression of the poor by the proud rich become the object of the game. The Lord has repeatedly rebuked those who would pridefully withhold their means from the poor and persecute them with their haughty attitudes.
Number three, making a mock of that which is sacred. Since pride is a sin of elevating oneself above God and the will of God, it is no wonder that the proud mock the things of God. This mockery not only includes the making light of sacred doctrines, practices, and covenants, but also manifests itself in the mockery of other people who are also sacred things in that they are literally sons and daughters of the living God. Number four, denying the spirit of prophecy and revelation. The pride-induced denial of the spirit of prophecy and revelation may be very blatant and open, but often it comes in more subtle, disguised forms. Speaking of the proud, President Besson illustrated some of these means. Quote, we pit our will against God's. When we direct our pride towards God, it is done in the spirit of, My will, not thine be done. The proud cannot accept the authority of God giving direction to their lives. They pit their perception of truth against God's greater knowledge, their abilities versus God's priesthood power, their accomplishments against his mighty works. The proud wish God would agree with them. They aren't interested in changing their opinions to agree with God's. End of President Benson's quote. Number five, murdering, plundering, lying, stealing, committing adultery. Selfishness is one of the most common faces of pride, declared President Benson. The selfish proud, with enmity towards their fellow man, see nothing wrong with resorting to selfish means to fulfill their desires and attain their ends. Prideful selfishness inevitably leads to other transgressions against one's fellow man. Illinois Maxwell declared, Selfishness is much more than an ordinary problem because it activates all the cardinal sins. It is the detonator in the breaking of the Ten Commandments. By focusing on oneself, it is naturally easier to bear false witness if it serves one's purpose. It is easier to ignore one's parents instead of honoring them. It is easier to steal because of what one of what one wants prevails. It is easier to covet since the self conclude that nothing should be denied them. It is easier to commit sexual sin because to please oneself is the name of that deadly game in which others are often cruelly used. The Sabbath day is easily neglected since one day soon becomes just like another. If self, if selfish, if selfish, it is easier to lie because the truth is conveniently subordinated. The selfish individual thus seek to please not God but himself. He will even break a covenant in order to fix an appetite. End of Elder Maxwell's quote. Number six, rising up in great contentions. The scriptures teach that another form of wickedness that resulted from pride is contention. Only by pride cometh contention. Contentions result from prideful power struggles that come from pitting ourselves, our passions, or our intellect against others. The proud are easily offended, hold grudges, withhold forgiveness, and will not receive counsel or correction. All of these internal traits become a fertile seedbed for the external manifestation of contention. The Savior warned of the evil of contention because it repels the Spirit of the Lord and opens the door to other fiery darts of the adversary. Contention does not usually begin as strife between countries, Elder Russell and Nelson declared. More often it starts with an individual, for we can contend within ourselves over simple matters of right and wrong. From there, contention can infect neighbors and nations like a spreading sore. The work of the adversary may be likened to loaded guns in opposing the work of, of God. Salvos, meaning an excuse containing germs of contention, are aimed and fired at strategic targets essential to that holy work. These vital targets include, in addition to the individual, the family, leaders of the church, and divine doctrine. Number seven, boasting in their own strength. A proud person puffs himself up in his, his self strength and his strength. Let me start again. A proud person puffs himself and his strength up as he puts down his dependency upon the Lord. Pride inevitably led to boast, leads to boasting, which inevitably leads to the loss of the strength of the Lord and causes the proud person to be left alone, relying slowly, solely on his own puny mortal strength. 
one of the most common of all sins among worldly people, Marv, Elder Marvin J. Ashton of the Quorum of the Twelve, has taught is relying on and then boasting in the arm of flesh. This is a most serious evil. It is a sin born of pride, a sin that creates a frame of mind which keeps men from turning to the Lord and accepting his saving grace. When a man knowingly or unknowingly engaged in self-exaltation because of his riches, his political power, his worldly learning, his physical prowess, his business ability, or even his works of righteousness, he is not in tune with the Spirit of the Lord. The many abominations in the scriptures to avoid a boasting send a message that we should realize the source of all our blessings. Everything is given by God. All talent, creative, creativity, ability, insights, and strength comes from Him. In our own strength, we can do nothing. When we seek the praise of man more than the praise of God, it will become easy to fall. End of quote. Chapter 4, verse 23, the phrase, Because of their iniquity, there began to be this, they began to disbelieve in the spirit of prophecy and the spirit of revelation. Some people rationalize their apostasy in their life of sin by saying that they do not believe in prophecy and revelation. It is significant to note from these verses that iniquity led the people to deny the spiritual workings of the Lord, not the other way around. Wickedness destroys faith in the Lord and brings a loss of spiritual knowledge and denial of such things as prophecy and revelation. Chapter 4, verse 24 through 26, they, became, they had become weak. Because of their wickedness, the Spirit of the Lord was withdrawn. The Lord no longer protected them, and they were left in a weakened condition. This is as much a physical reality as it is spiritual. Just as righteousness and faithfulness to covenants brings a renewing of the body, so wickedness can have a very real effect on the physical body that can sap strength and produce sickness and intense sufferings. Elder M. Russell Ballard gave this warning, quote, You must be honest with yourself and remain true to the covenants you have made with God. Do not fall into the trap of thinking you can sin a little and it will not matter. Remember, the Lord cannot look upon sin with the least degree of allowance. Some youth foolishly rationalize that it is no big deal to sin now because they can always repent later when they want to go to the temple or on a mission. Anyone who does that is breaking promises made to, bo to God both in the pre-mortal life and in the waters of baptism. The idea of sinning a little is self-deception. Sin is sin. Sin weakens your spirituality, and it always places the sinner at eternal risk. Choosing to sin, even with the intent to re repent, is simply turning away from God and violating covenants. End of quote. Isn't that interesting? Even violating covenants we made in pre-mortal life. Helaman chapter 5. Chapter 5, verse 2, the phrase, the voice of the people. When the people desired a king, 62 years previously, Mosiah canceled the government should be by the voice of the people, stating it was not common for the majority of the people to desire unrighteousness. Government by the voice of the people was referred to a monarchy in which an unrighteous king might lead them to destruction. At this time prior to the Savior's coming, however, the Nephites who choose, chose evil were more numerous than those who chose good. This corruption provided the truth of Moroni's con caution that should this event occur, then is the time that the judgments of God will come upon you. Yea, then is the time he will visit you with great destruction. This warning was fulfilled with the destruction preceding the Savior's appearance. The Lord declared this principle true in our day as well. When the wicked rule, the people mourn. Chapter 5, verse 3, the phrase, They could not be governed by the law nor justice, save it were to their destruction. The people had become so wicked that the voice of the people chose only that which was evil. As a result, they turned from just laws and righteous principles and would not be governed by such. The voice of the people desired that they be governed by those principles that the righteous leaders knew would surely lead to physical captivity, destruction, and ultimately spiritual death. Boy, do we see that being fulfilled today in our government. Much like our government today, John Adams observed, quote, Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other, 
end of quote. He wasn't the only founding father to hold this view. Indeed, James Madison wrote that the Constitution requires sufficient virtue among men for self-government. Otherwise, nothing less than the change of de despotism can restrain them from destroying and devouring one another. And so we see that happening today because of the lack of morals and values and virtue among the people today. Helam 5, chapter, chapter 5, verse 5 through 14, remember. In Helam in chapter 5, the word remember is used 15 times. President Spencer W. Kimball said the following about the importance of the word remember. Quote, when you look in the dictionary for the most important word, what, do you know what it is? It could be remember, because all of you have made covenants. You know what to do. You know how to do it. Our greatest need is to remember. That is why everyone goes to sacrament meeting every Sabbath day, to take the sacrament and listen to the priest pray that they may always remember him and keep his commandments which he has given them. Nobody should ever forget to go to sacrament meeting. Remember is the word. Remember is the program. End of quote. In chapter 5, we see a pattern that helped the wicked to remember and come unto Christ. This pattern is depicted by the following chart. And so, first of all, there was a cloud of darkness that overcame the wicked. Chapter 5, verse 28, we need to recognize that we are covered by a cloud of darkness, sin, here in mortality. The next step there was a call to repentance. In chapter 5, verses 29 through 33, listen to and heed the voice, conscience, Holy Ghost, to repent. Then in chapter 5, they looked to God's servants who knew the truth. They saw Nephi and Lehi. Chapter 5, verse 36 through 39, look to God's servants who are encircled with the power of God and converse with angels. This is the whole story of Lehi and Nephi being in prison and those prisoners being encircled by darkness and then seeing me finally high encircled by power. Then cry unto God, chapter 541, cry with all our hearts to God to obtain faith in Christ. And so they, to overcome the darkness, they started to cry unto God. And then they sought and received the Holy Ghost, 542 through 44, Cry and repent unto God until the cloud of darkness, sin, is removed, and you then become enlightened. That's what those in prison did. Then the darkness was lifted. 545. Receive of the Holy Ghost to enter to your heart, causing a mighty change. Then the sin of darkness and the darkness of this world will be lifted from us. And then they were given peace. Chapter 5, verse 46 to 48, peace is given because of their faith in the Savior and angels ministered. So hopefully that is helpful on how we can come to remember Christ if we do those things that will help us to always remember him. Chapter 5, verse 6 through 7, remember your names. Helaman had a special way of transferring his heritage to his sons. He named them after their noble ancestors to help his sons remember their righteous works. The following insight by, Carlo, by Elder Carlos E. Essay of the Presidency of the Seventy helps us appreciate what this meant to Nephi and Lehi. Quote, through, though all of Adam's children may not have received names of significance, many have. It has made a difference. It made a difference in the lives of Helaman's sons, Nephi and Lehi. The records attest that Nephi and Lehi did pattern their lives after their forebears or namesakes and did bring honor to the names given them. End of quote. President George Albert Smith provided a modern illustration of the profound influence that a good name may have upon a person. Quote, One day I lost consciousness of my surroundings and thought I had passed to the other side. I found myself standing with my back to a large and beautiful lake facing a great forest of trees.
I began to explore, and soon I found a trail through the woods which seemed to have been used very little, and which was almost obscured by grass. I followed this trail, and after I had walked for some time, and had traveled a considerable distance through the forest, I saw a man coming towards me. I became aware that it was a very large man, and I hurried my steps to reach him, because I recognized him as my grandfather. In mortality, he weighed over 300 pounds, so you may know he was a large man. I remember how happy I was to see him coming. I had been given his name and had always been proud of it. When Grandfather, who was George A. Smith, came within a few feet of me, he stopped. His stopping was an invitation for me to stop. Then, and this I would like the boys and girls and the young people never to forget, he looked at me very earnestly and said, I would like to know what you have done with my name. Everything I had ever done passed before me as though it were a flying picture on a screen. Everything I had done. Quickly, this vivid retrospect came down to the very time I was standing there. My whole life had passed before me. I smiled and looked at my grandfather and said, I have never done anything with your name of which you need be ashamed. He stepped forward and took me in his arms, and as he did so, I became conscious again of my earthly surroundings. My pillow was as wet as though water had been poured on it, wet with tears of gratitude that I could answer unashamed. Brothers and sisters, may we all be able to say that one day as we return and report to Christ, what have we done with his name? May we be able to say nothing that you need to be ashamed of. I, continuing the story, I have thought of this many times. I want to tell you that I have been trying more than ever since that time to take care of that name. So I want to say to the boys and girls, to the young men and women, to the youth, the church, and to all the world, honor your father and your mothers, honor the names that you bear, because someday you'll have the privilege and the obligation of reporting to them and to your father in heaven, what have you done with their names? End of his story. Quote, Chapter 5, verse 8, the phrase, lay up for yourselves a treasure in heaven. The treasure in heaven is the kingdom of, in heaven, the church of the firstborn, or in other words, eternal life. Laying up for ourselves a treasure in heaven means living the principles and keeping the commandments that enable one to receive that treasure through the grace of Jesus Christ. That is, that treasure of eternal life. Chapter 5, verse 9, the phrase, There is no other way nor means whereby man can be saved. There is a name that is above every name that is named, whether on earth or in heaven, save only the name of the Almighty Elohim. There is a name that brings joy to the desolate heart, a name that speaks peace to the sorrowing soul. There is a name that falls in hushed and hallowed tones from the lips of saints and angels, a name that leads true believers on both sides of the veil to glory and honor everlastingly. It is the name of the one sent of God to bring salvation, the name of one who paid an infinite price to ransom us from Satan's grasp. It is the blessed name of Jesus Christ. Elder Richard G. Scott of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles used Helaman 9 to teach that only the miraculous atonement makes salvation possible. Quote, Full repentance is absolutely essential for the atonement to work. It is a complete miracle in your life. By understanding the atonement, you will see that God is not a jealous being who delights in persecuting those who misstep. He is an absolute perfect, compassionate, understanding, patient, and forgiving Father. He is willing to entreat, counsel, strengthen, lift, and fortify. He so loves each of us that he was willing to have his perfect, sinless, absolutely obedient, totally righteous Son experience indescribable agony and pain and give himself in sacrifice for all. Through that atonement, we can live in a world where absolute justice reigns in its sphere so the world will have order. But that justice is tempered through mercy attainable by obedience to the teachings of Jesus Christ. Which of us is not in need of such, 
of the miracle of repentance. Whether your life is lightly blemished or heavily disfigured from mistakes, the principles of recovery are the same. The length and severity of the treatments are conditioned to fit the circumstances. Our goal solely must be forgiveness. The only possible path to that goal is repentance, for it is written, There is no other way nor means where my man can be saved only through the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. End of quote. Chapter 5, verse 20. The phrase, he should not come to redeem them in their sins, but to redeem them from their sins. The plan of salvation called for a Savior to, mean, to redeem fallen man from their condition of sinlessness on condition of faith in Christ, repentance, baptism, reception of the Holy Ghost, and continued obedience to gospel principles and ordinances. Redeeming one in sin would go counter to the plan of salvation and would destroy agency and accountability. In the premortal councils of heaven, by stating that he would save them all, Lucifer essentially proposed the redemption of all men and women in their sins. Quote, if you undertake to save all, said President Young, you must save them in unrighteousness and corruption. End of quote. Elder Orson Pratt also taught that difference between the father's plan to save his children and from from sin and Lucifer's designs to save all mankind in their sins. Quote, there must be difference between the father's plan to save his children from sin and there, I'm sorry, there must be an agency whenever intelligence exists and without agency, no intelligent being could exist. And Satan sought to destroy this and to redeem them all in their sins. End of quote. This distinction seems important in light of the philosophies of Antichrist in the Book of Mormon and in modern days who claim that all mankind should be saved at the last day and they need not fear nor tremble for the Lord had also redeemed all men and in the end all should, men should have eternal life. No, God cannot save us in our sins. We cannot say, eat, drink, be merry, and fear God, and he will justify in the little things. God can only save us from our sins through repentance. Chapter 5, verse 11, the phrase was, bringeth unto the power of the Redeemer unto the salvation of their souls. This passage may be understood if one word, which is implicit in the scriptures, were explicably inserted, which bringeth unto them the power of the Redeemer. Amalek taught that as a result of people's faith unto repentance, the atonement and the mercy of Christ can satisfy the demands of justice and encircles them in the arms of safety. Our faith and repentance brings us to that power which redeems even the power of the Redeemer. Chapter 5, verse 12, the rock of our Redeemer. Christ is the only sure foundation upon which man must build his life in order to withstand the powers of the adversary. He literally reminds his sons and us that if we are solidly built upon Christ, we cannot fall. Numerous scriptural passages refer to this concept as concept with various images and symbols. Christ is a sure foundation, a cornerstone, a nail in the sure place. Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone is the foundation stone upon which the plan of salvation, the whole gospel structure, rests. There is safety from Satan and his minions only in Christ. There is security only in his words and through his infinite and eternal power. In verse 12, the phrase, and his mighty storm shall beat upon you. President Spencer W. Kimball described the modern storm Satan sends upon Heavenly Father's children today when he said, quote, We too are faced with powerful destructive forces unleashed by the adversary. Waves of sin, wickedness, immorality, degradation, tyranny, deceitfulness, conspiracy, and dishonesty threaten all of us. They come with great power and speed and will destroy us if we are not watchful. But a warning is sounded for us. It behooves us to be alert and to listen and flee from the evil of our eternal lives. Without help, we cannot stand against it. We must flee to higher ground or cling fast to that which can keep us from being swept away. That to which we must cling for safety is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is our protection from whatever force the evil one can muster. 
An inspired Book of Mormon prophet counseled his people, Remember that it is upon the rock of our Redeemer, who is Christ, the Son of God, that you must build your foundation, that when the devil shall send his mighty winds, yea, his shafts in the whirlwind, when all his hell and his mighty storms shall beat upon you, it shall have no power over you to drag you down to the gulf of misery and endless woe. End of his quote. There again, there's that importance of the word, remember. Chapter 5, verse 18. The phrase, they also had that which they should speak given unto them. As agents of the Lord, they sought to be in tune so that they could speak the words of their principle. They were led and guided by the power of the Holy Ghost. And as such, they had the very words divinely provided for them. This is Lehi and Nephi. Always and forever, the counsel of the Master to his servants is, Treasure up in your minds continually the words of life, and it shall be given you in the very hour that portion that you shall be meted unto every man. Lift up your voices unto this people, Christ commanded in a modern revelation, Speak the thoughts that I shall put in your hearts, and ye shall not be confounded before men, for it shall be given you in the very moment what ye shall say. Chapter 5, verse 23 the phrase encircled about as if by fire. This Pentecostal occasion came to pass largely because of the faith and power of Nephi and Lehi, because two men paid the price to prepare themselves to teach and minister with power and authority of God. This particular experience could refer to a general protective influence protective influence of the spirit, or more likely to the presence of heavenly beings in the prison with Lehi and Nephi. Chapter 5, verse 24, A Pillar of Fire. This is a manifestation of the glory and power of the Almighty. Chapter 5, verse 30, the phrase, A still voice of perfect mildness. The Lord will not shout to gain our attention. Our attention. He whispers. The Spirit speaks in perfect mildness, but penetrates to the heart and very core of the soul. We just need to listen. Chapter 5, verse 35 through 41, Amidadab and a cloud of darkness, cry unto the voice, even until ye shall have faith in Christ. We are told in the record that Amidadab was a Nephite by birth who had once belonged to the church of God, but had dissented from them. His reaction, as recorded in Helaman 5.35, showed that he still had some knowledge of what one must do to repent and turn to the Lord. Elder F. Burton Howard of the 70 gave the following explanation, quote, to find the way back as Aminadab remembered, one must repent and pay until doubt and darkness disappear and important things can be seen again. It is, impos it, it is possible to return. It is possible for those who have ceased to pray to pray again. It is possible for those who are lost to find their way through the dark and come home. And when they do, they will know, as I know, that the Lord is more concerned with what a man is than with what he was, and with what he is then with what he has been. End of quote. Under the influence of the Spirit, Abinadab urged the others to pray to the voice they had heard until they could obtain a faith in Christ. Faith comes as a gift of God only when the initial desire is nurtured and nourished. Faith is a gift of God, wrote Elder Orson Pratt. In what manner does he, does he impart this gift to the mind of the immediate operation of the Holy Spirit, independent of any other means? Does he bestow it, unsought for and irrespective of the preparation of the mind? Does he confer it independent of the agency of man? To say that man obtains this gift without preparing himself or without the exercise of any agency is to deprive himself of all responsibility in regard to whether he has faith or not. End of quote. Helium 5 verse 45, 44, the phrase, they were filled with that joy which is unspeakable and full of glory. This is the gift of the Spirit that comes from, that should be from being, That comes from being pure and righteous and from knowing the peaceable things of the kingdom. Spiritual outpourings that come as one comes to know, understand, and experience in the atonement always include unspeakable joy. 
chapter 5, verse 45, the phrase, they were filled as if with fire. The reception of the Holy Ghost is the baptism of fire spoken of in the scriptures. They were baptized with fire, but in the words of the Savior, they knew it not. The phrase in 45, they could not, they could speak forth marvelous words, meant being filled with the Spirit of the Lord. Men, women, and even babes can speak forth marvelous words, praises, and prophecies. It is of one of the gifts of the fruits of the Spirit, such as are reserved for and bestowed upon those who are in tune with the Spirit. Chapter 5, verse 47, Peace be unto you. The promise given by the voice of the Lord to the people who believed on the words of Lehi and Nephi is the same for all dispensation. Peace to the soul, not as the word giveth, comes as a gift of grace through unshaken faith in Christ's holy name, and through relying wholly upon the merits of him who is mighty to save. Peace is one of the fruits of the Spirit which cannot be duplicated by Satan and is one of the greatest gifts one can receive from God. In answer to all of Calvary's requesting a witness from God about the truthfulness of the gospel, the Savior said, did I, not, did I not speak peace to your mind concerning the matter? What greater witness than that then can ye have from God? So if you ever feel peace, brother and sister, that is one way you know that it is not you coming up with it. It is not anyone else. That is from God. Only God can give us peace and it cannot be duplicated by the Holy Ghost. Peace is a sure witness that the answers and inspiration we're receiving is from Jesus Christ, our Father in Heaven, and the Holy Ghost. Chapter 5, verse 48, the phrase, Angels came down out of heaven and ministered unto them. There never has been a gospel dispensation without the ministering of angels. A people who cannot claim the mission of angels cannot claim an everlasting gospel. Without the mission of angels and other forms of revelation, our theology would be like a body without a spirit. Joseph Smith explained that, quote, There are no angels who minister to this earth but those who belong or have belonged to it, end of quote. Thus, President Joseph F. Smith observed, quote, When messengers are sent to minister to the inhabitants of this earth, they are not strangers, but from the ranks of our kindred friends and fellow beings and fellow servants. The ancient prophets who died were those who came to visit their fellow creatures upon the earth. They came to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. It was such holy beings, if you please, who waited upon the Savior and ministered to him on the mount. In like manner, our fathers, mothers, brothers, and sisters, and friends who have passed away from this earth, having been faithful and worthy to enjoy these rights and privileges, may have a mission given them to visit their relatives and friends upon the earth, again, bringing from the divine present messages of love, of warning, of reproof, and instruction to those whom they had learned, love, they had learned to love in the flesh. End of quote. Chapter 5, verse 50 through 52, and chapter 6, 1 through 8, a dramatic transformation. The power and impact of Nephi and Lehi's mission upon the Lamanites were dramatic. Following their successful mission, notice the following first-time experiences that occurred in the history of the majority of the Lamanites. One, the majority of the Lamanites were converted to the gospel. Two, the Lamanites laid down their weapons and their hatred and false traditions. Three, they freely yielded up the land that belonged to the Nephites. Four, the majority of the Lamanites became more righteous than the Nephites. Five, the Lamanites began to preach the gospel to the Nephites. Six, there was peace in all the land. Seven, the Lamanites and Nephites had open travel and free trade one with another. Let's now turn to our last chapter, Helaman, chapter 6. Chapter 6, verses 4 through 5, the phrase, Many of the Lamanites did come down into the land of Zarahemla and did declare unto the people of Nephi the manner of their conversion. There is a spirit of tragic irony in these verses. The Lamanites have received the gospel through the Nephites, but many of the Nephites have fallen into apostasy. It must have been an unusual experience for many of the more zealous Lamanite converts to labor among the Nephites and encourage them to return to the faith of their fathers. There is a similar ironic episode in the history of the restored church, one which tugs at the heartstrings much as this missionary movement must have done. 
John Taylor had been converted to the gospel and baptized in Canada in May of 1836 through the inspired preaching of Elder Parley P. Pratt. B. H. Roberts writes of a difficult time in the history of the church, quote, in, much, in March of the following year, 1837, Elder Taylor visited Kirtland and there met the prophet Joseph Smith who entertained him at his house and gave him many items of information pertaining to the work of the Lord in this dispensation. At that time, there was a bitter spirit of apostasy rife in Kirtland. A number in the Quorum of the Twelve were disaffected towards the prophet, and the church seemed on the point of disintegration. Among others, Party Pew Pratt was floundering in darkness, and coming to Elder Taylor, told him of some things wherein he considered the prophet Joseph in error. To this remark, Elder Taylor replied, I am surprised to hear you speak so, Brother Party. Before you left Canada, you bore a strong testimony to Joseph Smith being a prophet of God and to the truth of the work he had inaugurated. And you said you knew these things by revelation and the gift of the Holy Ghost. You gave to me a strict charge to the effect that through you or an angel from heaven was to declare anything else, I was not to believe it. Now, Brother Parley, it is not for man that I am following, but the Lord. The principles you taught me led me to him, and I know and I now have the same testimony that you then rejoiced in. If the work was true six months ago, it is true today. If Joseph Smith was then a prophet, he is now a prophet. To the honor of Parley, be it, it said, he sought no further to lead Elder Taylor astray, nor did he use much argument in the first place. He, with many others, says Elder Taylor, were passing under a dark cloud. He soon made right. So he, he soon made all right with the prophet Joseph Smith and was restored to full fellowship. End of quote. Chapter 6, verses 15 through 41. What a painful reality it is that Satan never sleeps. At this period of Book of Mormon history, righteousness is allowed to have a foothold for only five years before the wickedness is given an organized thrust through the bands of Gadianton. The hordes of hell are unleashed again upon the Nephites and Lamanites. The chief judge and his son are murdered by secret combinations. The government is taken over by the wicked. Both Nephi and the Lamanites join hands with demons in human form to spread death and desolation, and the secret and covenants and signs of old, those silent and subtle means of communication had by the ungodly from the days of their first master mayhem are revealed and spread among the people. Chapter 6, verse 17, Therefore they began to set their hearts upon their riches. What went wrong? Why would the people turn again to evil? How could they fell so quickly into decay and perversion? Herein is the key the lust for riches, the unbridled quest for power and money, pride. How sickening is the cycle and how nauseating is man's obsession with himself and his worldly possessions. President Henry B. Iron, the first presidency, taught that worldliness is an obstacle to inspiration and spirituality. Quote, God is forgotten out of vanity. A little prosperity and peace, or even a turn slightly for the better, can bring us feeling of, feelings of self-sufficiency. We can quickly... We can feel quickly that we are in control of our lives, that the change for the better is our own doing, not that of God, who communicates to us through the still small voice of the Spirit. Pride creates a noise within us which makes the quiet voice of the Spirit hard to hear. And soon in our vanity, we no longer even listen for it. We can come quickly to think we don't need it. End of quote. Chapter 6, verses 16 through 40 the evils of secret combinations. Helaman chapter 6 provides several insights into secret combinations, including how they work, what motivates them, and how they come to power. Number one, their two objectives are to get gain and power, then they glory in it. Number two, secret combinations require general wickedness to survive. Number three, secret combinations thrive on secrecy, violation of which is a capital offense. Four, secret combinations involve formal covenant making. Number five, they, are, they use murder, violence, threat of violence, plunder, vice, whoredoms, and flattery, flattery to get gain and power. Number six, secret combinations operate on laws contrary to the laws of the country. 
Number seven, Satan is the grand conspirator and author. Number eight, participants have court trials for their own people, not according to the laws of the land, but according to their own set of laws. Number nine, they seek to take government power as rapidly as possible. Number 10, participants seek to overthrow freedom for others, but seek to maintain freedom for themselves. Number 11, secret combinations cause the destruction of nations. Number 12, secret combinations are abominable in God's sight. Chapter 5, verses 25 through 26. Alma had recommended that Helaman teaches people an eternal hatred of sin, and more specifically, make known generally the wickedness and God-ordained destruction of the Jaredites. On the other hand, he had forbidden Helaman to make known the secret signs and covenants and oaths of secret combinations described on the 24 gold plates. Helaman had been true to his word. How then had such things come to be known by the wicked among the Nephites and Lamanites? Simply stated, Satan delivered an independent revelation. He put such ideas and information into the hearts and minds of the ungodly. Chapter 6, verse 27, a phrase, that same being who did plot with Cain. The story of the origin and rise of secret combinations on earth was once contained in the Old Testament times. Such plain and precious truths concerning the nature of the gospel anciently, the particulars of the plan of salvation, and the then future ministry of Jesus Christ as prophesied among the ancients, and the manner in which Cain plotted with Satan to become master Mahan, master of the great secret that he could murder and get gain, these matters were deleted from the Bible record before the book was compiled. They were known among the Nephites through their scripture record we know as the brass plates. These truths were restored by revelation to Joseph Smith and Seer through inspiration, by his, through his inspired translation of the Bible, which would be the book of Moses and the Pearl of Great Price. Chapter 6, verse 30, He who is the author of all sin. Wherefore, because that Satan rebelled against me and sought to destroy the agency of man, which I, the Lord God, had given him, and also that I should give unto him mine own power, by the power of mine only begotten, I caused that he should be cast down, and he became Satan, yea, even the devil, the father of all lies, to deceive and to blind men, and to lead them captive at his will, even as many as would not hearken unto his voice. Thank you for watching. Hopefully that helped you with some of the doctrine and principles in these very troubling, serious chapters of Helaman 1 through 6, where Satan had gotten such control on the hearts of men. If this presentation has helped you, please hit the like button.